Thank you very much. You're all very welcome to LSE's uh, Grantham Research Institute, IPA, co-host with the Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice. And uh, it's part of a program which was initiated by Mercator, to whom we're also very grateful. And we're addressing an issue which was left hanging at a series of events that were held in Berlin in November. And it was about the innocent in the world that are victims of the unfolding, now largely speaking, accepted reality of climate change. And we've put together a day's events on which Nick will speak in a moment about this whole issue of what to do about climate and also in particular the role of justice in the management of our climate crisis. And it's in that uh, spirit that we have devoted this evening of events, uh, this, e this day of events, to this evening open forum with uh, an, a remarkable uh, array of specialists in the field. And uh, we're going to hear in a minute from Nick Stern, our own Nick Stern, who needs literally no introduction, president of the British Academy, among other things, Grantham chair, and then from Mayor Robinson, who is now, as I've said already, having been president and UN High Commissioner, uh, president of this Mayor Robinson Trust Climate Justice. And then we're going to go into a, a very novel aspect of this project, because we're going to hear from five people who have particular perspectives, and their perspectives are driven today by their knowledge of and awareness of this notion of the punishment of the innocent. We're going to start with Desma Williams, who's the former ambassador of Grenada to the United Nations. Then we have uh, Sheila Patel, who's chair of Slum Dwellers International. Then we have Marvin Nala, who's the climate and energy campaigner for Greenpeace in China. And then we have Henry Xu, Professor of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford. And then we have Sharon Burroughs, great pleasure to have here at LSE, the most senior trade union, uh, woman trade unionist in the world, because Sharon is Secretary General of the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, but we're not going to, I'm afraid, let them speak for too long, because we want to hear from you as well. And there'll be a pause then for an engagement with the audience which will involve questions and comments and so on, on which more shortly. And then we'll move to the politics. And we're very lucky to have Kaio Kovesa, who's the vice chairman of Deutsche Bank and also chair of the European Climate Foundation. And he'll speak on the business dimension. And if we can persuade him a little on the politics, though he is reluctant, he has some political experience. And there are other people on the panel who have political experience too, not least Mary. So we might hear from her then as well. So we go back to Q&A and we end with Nick and Mary Robinson. What we intend you to get out of this, finishing at 8 o'clock and not much later than that, is a strong sense of the international perspective, truly international, and also some understanding of what could be done and some deeper awareness of what we mean when we throw out ideas like climate justice and a punishment of the innocent. I suppose I should reluctantly announce that I'm Conor Geerty from the IPA, <laughs> the only person not introduced. Uh, and with that, hand over to my colleague, uh, Nick Stern. Thank you very much, uh, Connor, and thank you very much to all our colleagues in the Mary Robinson Foundation in the Grantham Institute who worked so hard to um, make this happen. And you can see from the number of people on the platform that it wasn't that easy uh, to make things happen. Now, my task in about five minutes is to report on much of the day. Um, but, so I'll talk uh, quite rapidly, but this is the LSE and you're very smart, so there's no problem in doing that. Um, what we try to do is to start with an understanding of the problem, what is climate change, and to bring to it 
basic ideas from moral philosophy and ethics and try to drive them to what uh, ideas and principles that could guide practical discussion. So we had to go a long way in that discussion. Now, we began with a shared understanding of the magnitude of the challenge. Unmanaged climate change could transform the planet in a century. It could take us, we don't know exactly how much, this is risk management, of course, but we, it could take us to uh, temperatures of 3, 4, 5 degrees centigrade or more uh, in 100 years or so. Um, that would be transformational. We haven't seen 4 or 5 degrees centigrade for 30 million years or so. We haven't seen 3 degrees centigrade for 3 million years or so. It would likely rewrite the relationships between human beings and the planet. It could easily move a lot of people through that uh, transformation. And um, it could result, that could result in conflict. Overall, it could result in uh, arresting and setting back of development. We could be much poorer a hundred years from now as a result of an unmanaged climate change and it's the poorest who get hit earliest and hardest. So that's the story of the issue in a nutshell. Uh, by uh, not by failing to manage climate change what we do is to um, damage, maim and kill people at some distance in the future. It's difficult for people to get their head round that because it's with a long lag and subject to uncertainty. But it's very important to start with what we're talking about. And that, that is punishing the innocent because it's punishing people who had no direct responsibility or minimal direct responsibility for the problem that is, we're trying to manage. Now, most of us would regard this as profoundly wrong. Moral philosophers try to help us understand Indeed, they try to understand themselves the sense in which that's profoundly wrong. Now, the standard economics um, uh, toolkit is basic consequentialism, versions of utilitarianism and welfareism. You look at the consequences for different people and you uh, try to judge whether those consequences are good or bad. Often you do that in a way that aggregates across people. Rights and justice, on the other hand, talk about the violation of entitlements the violations of rights. An injustice is to violate a right or an entitlement. And that takes us to a meaning of right or entitlement. And we have to think about the meaning of right or entitlement in terms of um, uh, issues around uh, common humanity, what it means to be an equal human being, uh, and for much of the discussion, we understood that in terms of rights to development, uh, rights to development articulated through ideas of standard of living or the capabilities of reaching different standards of living. So that is a very rapid canter through an awful lot of underlying moral philosophy which you'd have to kick and test and examine, and that's the sort of thing that you do in universities, but I've been very fast in doing that. I think you can see that expressing it in this way can already have political impact. And I would draw the analogy with the Millennium Development Goals. A number of people in this room were involved in discussing the Millennium Development Goals, helping put them in place, talking about finance for Millennium Development Goals. Those were articulated uh, under seven broad headings around um, poverty and education and health and gender and environmental issues. And they did actually have a profound influence on the way in which economic development was pursued. And they were derived from understanding, uh, or trying to understand, these basic notions of what are the capabilities a human being would need in order to uh, be capable of participating in a society in, on something like uh, equal terms and pursuing a life that they have reason to value or producing a life they value uh, or have reason and, ha and have reason to value in the language of Amartya Sen. So that's the way in which we uh, described it. The final thing I want to draw attention to was a, an idea that was central in our discussions 
and that is equitable access to sustainable development. If you get if you get close to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as you must in these negotiations, because that's where they take place, you have to deal with a very important and key concept from the, get, the beginning of common but differentiated responsibility. In Cancun, uh, this was at COP16 in, in uh, Cancun at the end of 2010. That was articulated in terms of, uh, or it began to be discussed at any rate, in terms of equitable access to sustainable development. That's a very important idea because it starts to talk. It means that people get together. They collaborate. They're asking what they can do together to create equitable access to sustainable development. It's dynamic. It's not a crude, static arm wrestle over some notion of total quantity of emissions. Total quantity of emissions is vitally important, but we begin to express the discussion in how we get together to enable overcoming of poverty and managing climate change. Managing climate change because this has to be sustainable. So that language was one that we found helpful and uh, a language that we should try and pursue, and we did start to pursue that language in terms of what it meant, in terms of the collaboration, the equity, the dynamics, uh, the sustainability, and so on. And I think they were, we were a bunch of optimists in the sense that we felt we could, we could, as a world, if we so wished, if we had the good sense, if we managed the politics we could actually find a way to, uh, in this century to overcome poverty and to manage the grave risks of climate change, but it would have to be very radical indeed, and actually it would be very attractive if we did it. We'd have to eliminate energy-related emissions by the second half of this century, and we'd find very different ways of doing things. Um, it would be years of discovery, and they'd be cleaner, quieter, uh, safer. Uh, more energy secure and more biodiverse. So what we were trying to do was go all the way from an understanding of the basic problem and we hope some understanding of the basic moral philosophy through to the kind of ideas of justice, climate justice and politics and negotiation that could get us where we want to go. I think we were optimistic about what we could do. We weren't all that optimistic about whether we would. Thank you. Uh, Mary. Well, it's really <coughs> wonderful to be back here in LSE. I've had the opportunity on a number of previous um, occasions, and this is a very special one, because apart from the very interesting discussion, which Nick Stern has summarized, I think, really very thoughtfully, uh, it's been a very hospitable day for my team, um, I have um, the honor to sort of lead a group of extraordinary individuals, and they are actually the other people on the platform here and a number in the rows here in front of you, who are part of a high-level advisory committee to the Climate Justice Dialogue, which the World Resources Institute and my foundation um, instituted about a year ago. We were very aware that there needed to be a different approach to climate, an approach that put people in the middle. This, after all, fundamentally is about how it affects people in their lives. And when you put people in the center, you quickly realize that there are layers of injustice that we have to think about. Because climate change is most harsh and already very severe in the most vulnerable countries. We're beginning to see its effects now in richer parts of the world, in the climate shocks and um, that have affected the flooding um, in, in London or in, um, in the UK. We're not saying that it's necessarily attributable narrowly to climate change. It's the kind of climate shock changes that are taking place. Um, in uh, um, Hurricane Sandy in the United States, the, um, uh, the fact that there's been uh, both the Arctic vortex and at the same time drought 
in the Midwest of the United States and indeed uh, the beginnings of water rationing in California and so on. But more than that, in the poorest countries, in the Philippines, for example, that terrible hurricane just before the climate conference in Warsaw. And over and over again, that is the story from poor countries and poor communities. The fact that things are so much worse because the weather is unpredictable. And if it's unpredictable, you don't know when to sow, you don't know when to harvest, it affects your food uh, production, your food security. And so we came together on this climate justice dialogue. We've had quite a number of meetings in different parts of the world. Uh, We've had uh, an opportunity to listen to people in various parts of the world, beginning last year in Chile, where a group of uh, Latin American states are very progressive on climate. And their top line, if you like, was, we're not going to wait for other countries. We actually know that it's the right thing to do to move, and we're going to work together to see where we will move on climate. Uh, We had a good conference in Dublin, I'm very glad to say. My foundation combined with the Irish government during Ireland's presidency of the European Union on hunger, nutrition, climate justice. Of the 300 participants at that conference who were commissioners from Europe because Ireland had the presidency of the EU, government representatives, etc., 100 were from grassroots communities, the experts, those who really know the impact that climate is having on their communities. We went to Bangladesh to the um, community-based adaptation and learned a lot from there. We were in uh, Addis for a, um, an African climate justice dialogue. Uh, we were in the Middle East, in Abu Dhabi, uh, for um, the impact of climate there and how they're using their fossil fuel to innovate. And they remind us of how quickly they were very poor developing countries, developed through fossil fuel, are trying to innovate and trying to frame their approach to, uh, to climate justice. And what we did after uh, a lot of discussion is launch last September a climate justice dialogue. And those of you who are interested can look at our cl- or, sorry, climate justice declaration. You can look at that declaration on our website, um, either the website of the foundation, which is the initials of the foundation, mrfcj.org, or I think it's climatejusticedialogue.org. Um, we're aware that other leadership groups have become interested in climate. Um, For whatever reason, I can't imagine why, I'm also one of the elders and um, brought together by Nelson Mandela, which is a great honor, and Leslie Ann Knight, the CEO of the elders, is sitting here in the front row. Um, The elders also have said this is an issue that has to be top priority. If we are going to give any kind of moral leadership in the world, this has to be an issue that we address with uh, a sense that it's about people and how they are affected and what will make a difference in policies. So part of what we were doing today was listening and taking part in the discussions with the Grantham Institute and the Institute for Public Affairs, which Conor Geerty um, is uh, director of, and also having our own discussions, which will continue tomorrow. So we were both discussing our own approaches to climate justice and greatly benefiting from the influence of the, and the stimulus of the intellectual discussions. To me, what it did was increase even more my sense of urgency and of the need for radical solutions. I love to say that in front of a young audience because you are the ones who are going to have to create this constituency of demand for far more radical measures. We have to say that we need a low-carbon world, a zero-carbon world by 2050. It's doable. At an expert level, the experts are agreed it's doable. The problem is the politics. Help us to change the politics. Um, We need to have much more transformative leadership. Help us to change the politics. We need to really have those who will go to Peru for the next COP in December and those who are working towards Paris to not dare go without being more radical in their approach. We need leaders to come to the climate summit that the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has decided to have in September, um, aware that if they don't come with innovative ideas, they will be heavily criticized. That's not the case at the moment. Um, Those who go to um, conferences of parties from the richer parts of the world, people don't know what they're doing, don't know where they're going, don't don't have much interest in the ministers of the environment or energy who go. So we have to get the top leadership, presidents, prime ministers, uh, finance ministers, um, everybody with the power to influence transformative leadership because this is a very simple proposition. It's not a trade negotiation. It is about the future 
of the ecosystem of our world and how we are stewards of it and how we think of intergenerational justice for the next generation. Um, I usually put that in very personal terms and I'll conclude by putting it in those terms because it makes me have that sense of an urgency and purpose. I wake up every morning with that urgency and purpose. I have four grandchildren, with a fifth on the way, I'm very happy to say, four grandchildren who will be in their 40s in 2050. They'll share the world with about nine billion others, and I also care about the children of that world, not just my own grandchildren. What will they say about us? What will they say about us if they are born into a world that is so climate insecure, so full of shocks. So when they know that we actually could have done differently, we could have taken that leadership and decisions, and it's now, it's between now and the end of 2015. For those of you who are studying at this time, it's a very interesting time. We have to get robust um, uh, replacement of the Millennium Development Goals, though they have to be fully implemented as far as possible, with the Sustainable Development Goals, which apply to all countries, and we have to get a robust climate agreement. Two huge agendas. This is for young people to really create a constituency of demand for justice, for fairness, for equity, for climate justice. Thank you. Over to you. Fantastic Elder Robinson, if I may say so. <laughs> Very chirpy for an elder. Uh, we now move on to the next phase, which is uh, our five colleagues uh, who are going to reflect on aspects of the punishment of the innocent. And, Desmond, you're going to kick us off, I think, uh, if you would. Uh, our ambassador, former ambassador from Grenada to the United Nations. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and a warm good afternoon from spicy Grenada. <laughs> <laughs> um, today actually marks the 35th anniversary of the Grenada Revolution, which was our youthful strike for justice in Grenada. So you can look it up. I was a part of that, and I'm happy to be a part of the, <laughs> <laughs> well done. the strike for climate justice. Um, going forward. Don't take those minutes from my, my accounting. <laughs> oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, I also want to welcome, I think my nephew is here. It's probably the first time he's come to a climate event. Are you here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking those minutes. <laughs> Since the inception, as an organized group, small island developing states have fought for a rule-based world to deliver justice and equity for all countries. In 1994, SIDS were the first to put forward a draft protocol which is universally acknowledged as a major contribution to the negotiations that led to the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. SIDS were at the forefront of developing a compliance system and for fighting, especially in Cancun, for what became the Durban Platform, which is the basis of the new agreement for 2015, which is now being negotiated. Now, small island developing states are among those states in the international system, I argue, with proven agency in achieving rights and justice in climate change diplomacy and whose continuing vision, leadership, and proposals for policies and programs offer potential for reducing injustice and climate dangers for themselves and for others. Let me quickly elaborate. Over the past 20 years of climate diplomacy, particularly in the UNFCCC, climate change negotiations, proposals, and other ideas presented by SIDS often with other climatically vulnerable groups and regions. These have been ambitious, scientifically informed, and morally driven. And these have been responses to the dangers and threats of climate change. The idea, for example, of including every, including SIDS in every governing structure and every decision-making climate body, which has been a democratic principle. The idea of being close to 1.5 degree maximum average global temperature for global survival. 
the idea of a loss and damage mechanism, the idea of justice, and many other significant ideas were the proposals of the small island developing states, which we fought for. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because we were once viewed as marginalized. Um, but one would argue that both SIDS and the ideas that we've put forward are now integral to climate thinking and regime operation due to the hard work. But in fact, despite these attainments, we still are very much victims of the system of climate change. And our right to survival and our development are systematically and dangerously denied. And yet the people of SIS continue to take steps at home and abroad with their governments on their own for ambitious, ambitious proposals. So my position this afternoon in the half a minute I have left. 24 seconds. And seven pages to go. <laughs> um, insists that this is a political issue. And the international community needs to partner more at every level, academic, political, uh, diplomatic, financial, <laughs> moral, and ethical, with those peoples, particularly the young people, women, farmers, and fishermen in the SIDS countries and in the other marginalized states because it is an issue uh, through which we can gain more rapid progress as justice and rights for people and, of course, for the international system. I want to close, having skipped over two or three of my main points, um, in suggesting that the efforts and the policy proposal of the SIDS help to attain human rights at home and to reduce climate change injustice. Think about it. And all of this will help to move the world and international relations further towards not just a system of states, but a society of states, where greater rights and justice are valued, are pursued, and achieved. And therefore, since we'll continue to do our part, we are maybe considered in the margin, we are certainly in the center of the struggle for our lives and the lives of others. And we invite you to work in the climate justice because it demands your greater participation. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that you're the guinea pig in my establishment of my authority. Uh, Sheila, uh, Chair Slum Dwellers International, I almost felt like a quiz. Your three minutes starts now. But uh, away you go. Decima is a hard act to follow, but I'm learning. Uh, I come here representing communities of the urban poor who for the last three generations since they migrated into cities have remained invisible in the eyes of all formal institutions. And what you have now is a situation where climate-related incidences have exacerbated the lives in, and their, their future. Because as you know, in the Global South, Poor people come into cities, many of them due to climate challenges in rural areas, and they live in dangerous and difficult parts of the city that the formal, the formal city doesn't want to develop, and they face evictions, and they face lots of inhuman situations in which they live. So for me, the participation in examining how climate change and the justice issues that it brings provides opportunity to produce new protocols that deal with more traditional injustices that poor people have faced and to bring into our collective consciousness the realization that this is the urban millennium when the MDGs were set up, 
We didn't think of the world as urban. There were very few goals that were related to the urban poor. Today, when you talk about 2015 and sustainable goals, you have to take into consideration that if you don't address the challenges of informality of habitat and livelihood of poor people in the cities, we're all in very big trouble. We have very little that is being done. I always come to universities and urge them to address issues of urban poverty, urban injustice, uh, and now, as we go into the debate on climate change, I feel that my own organization, which is basically social movements of urban poor in the global south in about 33 countries, embracing the challenge of what role they want to play. Because like the small island countries, we don't want to just remain victims. We want to be part of the solutions, and for that we need enlightened partnerships. We need to understand this complicated scientific formulation that all of you are presenting to us. And we need to acknowledge that in this constituency of poor people living in cities, a majority of them are below 30 years old. And that produces for the elders in informal settlements a huge challenge of how to go beyond their victimhood into becoming proactive, positive, and aggressive solution makers. And I encourage all of you to embrace them and their challenges. Thank you. Uh, well, Gina gets the prize for coming closest so far. <laughs> Gina is. Uh, fantastic. Uh, and now we have Marvin. Where's Marvin? There he is. Marvin from the Climate and Energy ca uh, Campaigner, who's a climate and energy campaigner in, uh, for Greenpeace in China. Marvin. Hi. Um, nice to have me, uh, me here. So I think like for, for young people like me, climate justice is kind of like self-evident conception. So uh, you can ever can imagine like in, by 2050, most of us will be over 60. That right now we are almost, we are mostly like say uh, over 20s. That means like most of our, our best time of our life will be threatened by climate change. What does that mean? That maybe means like your life will be threatened by the um, effect of the climate change. Your food price will be much higher. People you love, your children, your parents, will be more vulnerable to climate change. And even some nice places you want to visit may not be as same as right now. Some maybe even no longer exist. So that means like lots of like responsibilities for us. And it's not like only the responsibility for those thinkers and uh, politicians Maybe sitting here, especially sitting at the panel here, it's also our responsibility. For me, for example, I already imagine that in the next 50 years, I will, every week I may face kind of pressure or criticism for China's emission. It's a kind of very realistic, realistic thing. So we all face like kind of responsibility or pressure to really take actions. But at the same time, I don't, also don't like the, the term victim. The word like, uh, sounds like you are a passive individual. But actually, we are not. We are people who can take actions to be part of a solution. So I would say that climate change <laughs> not only means a kind of debt or threat, it also means a lot of opportunities for us. Many of us stepping out of the campus, we will go into the society. Some of you will go to the business, some of you will go to be politician or diplomat. Maybe some of you will be activists like me, go to Greenpeace, even in China. And I think that the burden is so heavy and we can actually make our 
rest of our lives to be part of the solution. We can, we can actually to make our work be more meaningful and to be beneficial for ourselves and for people we love and we care. Yes, thanks. Oh. Oh. Uh, Marvin, that was terrific. Uh, very moving. Uh, Henry, uh, away you go. Mm-hmm. Professor of Politics and International Relations, University of Oxford. As the member of this panel who's probably the closest to being a member of a past generation, it's a special privilege to, uh, to speak for the future generations. And I think it's useful symbolism that an old goat like me is the one who, who speaks for the future people. One starts as the future, one becomes the present, and then one becomes the past. One is, after all, just passing through. The earth remains. Other people come. Surely, then, we cannot do just whatever we like while we're here. In any civilized society, there are protections for the helpless. We, we begin as helpless adults, as helpless infants. We often end as, as helpless old people. We may be injured or sick along the way. A decent society does not simply leave the helpless to fend for themselves. We provide protections for the helpless. No one is any more vulnerable any more at our mercy than the people of the future. We can speak for what we need, what we want. They cannot. If anyone is to provide protections for the future, it will have to be us. No mechanism can guarantee that we give sufficient weight to the people of the future. The best protection for them is is a conscious commitment on our own part to give weight to what they need. A number of indigenous peoples have a saying that goes to the effect, in every decision, consider the effects on the seventh generation. If we all could think that way, uh, that would, would do it, I think. But we are myopic by default, and we need mechanisms to help us. And I I want to quickly just uh, list list some. The um, Rio Plus 20 conference endorsed the idea of the creation of a UN High Commissioner for Future Generations. This would have at least the merit of putting on the agenda, the question of what institutional uh, operationalizations we can create to protect the interests of the future. And some of my colleagues in the dialogue are are quite keen on this. I myself am a little um, doubtful whether the best solution is is more uh, global level bureaucracy. I think better solutions might be more local. Um, And let me just mention Uh, almost random collection. First, we could try to create a norm for much longer term audits, not ask how did we do in the last year, but ask how do we seem to be doing for the next 25 or 50 or 100 years. We'll probably get some of it wrong, but at least we can try to think about it. Second, but closely related thing, is to have what um, some theorists have called posterity impact statements. We have environmental impact statements. It would be uh, certainly do no harm if when major proposals came up, somebody had the responsibility to think through what their effects would probably be in 50 or 100 years. Third, one could have in cabinets or national cabinets or even in uh, city councils one minister or one counselor whose job was to represent future generations. Similarly, one could have a parliamentary select committee for the future 
Uh, Finland has such a committee, for example. And one could make it as powerful as one wanted. I mean, if, for example, every bill coming through the legislature was required at least to be commented on by the select committee for future generations, this would help bring people's attention. Now, all these things I've, I've mentioned, the audits, the impact statements, ministers, committees, would work only to the extent that we can actually foresee the needs of people of the future, a very different kind of thing that I think we need because there will be unpleasant surprises is simply a rapid reaction capacity. We need to create ways of responding quickly and effectively to threats to the future which we don't now anticipate. Through such mechanisms, and I do think it's important to create some institutional mechanisms to supplement the, the conscious commitments we can generate in people, we can try to avoid simply leaving future people to fend for themselves and give them a chance to control their lives, too. Okay. <laughs> Henry, thank you so much. Uh, this section is brought to an end now with Sharon, and then we go to you, and then we come back on business and the politics. So, Sharon, over to you. Uh, reminding people, you're Secretary General of the International Trade Union Confederation. Thank you, Connor. Well, it's very simple for us. There are no jobs on a dead planet. The impoverished negotiations in Warsaw, in fact, caused a walkout by unions, community, uh, environment and development groups. Because people, our communities, our jobs, they were simply not on the agenda as governments backed off from previously weak commitments. For union, uh, unions, employment and decent work is core business and climate change is not employment friendly. We're simply out of time. Beyond the escalating catastrophes from climate change, if you read the recent IPCC report, and I've read a number of them, and Nick's written a lot of uh, uh, complementary material, then it's frightening. 15 years to broad spectrum impact, 15 years. And indeed, industrial transformation, not even on the agenda, is so urgent when you consider that we've got to stabilise the world at 44 gigatons of carbon emissions. Hope I get the figures right, Nick. It's 59, this is a bit daunting, 59 gigatons on a business as usual scenario to 2020. You can do the maths. In fact, I'm going to quote Nick because he said of that report that slow, weak action increases the risk because greenhouse gases continue to accumulate in the atmosphere and the installation of long-lasting high-carbon capital and infrastructure simply locks in future emissions. It's brutal arithmetic, he said, and it should persuade companies, communities, cities and nations to seize the opportunity for sustained and sustainable growth offered by hastening their transition to a low-carbon economy. We believe there are opportunities in that transition. We can see the impact now. Changes in seasons and threats to agricultural production are impoverishing marginal communities, and increased food costs and health risks are absolutely significant. That's in addition, as I said, to the devastation of increasing catastrophes. Don't, don't listen to me. Look at HSBC's latest research. It identifies China, Indonesia, South Africa and Brazil as the five G20 nations most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Together they represent 31 per cent of projected global G GDP in 2050. Given that these emerging economies were touted as growth centres for global demand and we're still in an economic crisis, they were the great hope for exiting the, this crisis and of course we've already seen their growth slow. This is frightening stuff. It can't be stressed enough that the need to act is urgent. This, uh, it's, it's perhaps not surprising that, uh, that when we know to keep the temperature rise to around 2 degrees, as I said, you have to stabilise that uh, level at uh, th those gigatons, that we're seeing corporations throw billions of dollars lobbying against ambitious agreements. 
If, uh, if current uh, um, trajectories are locked in, then plans on the drawing board for 1,200 new coal-fired power plants around the world, we just see the gap widen. If we delay action, the costs increase. For example, in Africa, this figure just strikes me, 1% of GDP invested now in mitigation is required. If you don't address it within 20 years, the cost will rise to 4%, but no action will see a loss of 7% of Africa's GDP. That's just a frightening scenario. So why are governments stalling on an ambitious global agreement? Why are corporations not negotiating with us about systemic restructuring in terms of tra um, uh, industrial transformation? Why are our pension funds, $30 trillion invested in the global economy, why do they have less than 2 per cent of portfolio invested in green economy technology and services? We want the jobs of the future to be created now. We want to see investing in green infrastructure, renewable energies, public transport, building retrofits, biomanufacturing, sustainable agriculture. There are lots of traditional sectors we can save and enhance jobs. If you want an example of this, Germany's shift, not because of climate, but from nuclear energy, has created an investment base that's generated 400,000 new jobs in renewable energies and their supply chains. So the opportunities are there, but the measures for transforming all economic sectors, for providing workers with an alternative, for good quality jobs and supporting communities must be taken now. Climate change threatens everything the Labor movement stands for. Fairness, social justice, decent work. We'll meet as a global movement in May. We are, with 180 million members, the biggest democratic force on earth, and we will initiate a sign-up to climate action, sign-up to mobilise, to Lima, to Paris, to demand industrial transformation. We hope you'll join us. Two, two things that Nick Stern said. Um, if we had good sense and if we had the political will, and you're talking about we could do quite a lot. We, we, we come on to the topic of does this not take change at the top in corporations and at countries, but intra-country and intra-corporation? We're talking about vested interests, um, and that's where I think a lot of the problem lies. You're all doing everything you can, and it's fantastic. But I think for, for there to be real change, there needs to be intra-company and intra-country dynamics involved as well. And so I'd like to welcome you welcome Thank you. Thoughts. And can you tell us who you are? Did you want Sorry, to... my name is Jay Cantaria. Uh, MSc, I did a BSc in economics. I did an MSc in development studies. A lifelong student. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we take this lady in the front while we find that gentleman up there. Uh, front row. Uh, yes, I'm Sarah Glazer, and I'm a journalist doing some work for the Ford Foundation and NRDC in the U.S. on what cities are doing on climate change. I have a question for Sheila Patel, which is there's been discussion about adding an urban sustainable development goal when these millennium development goals expire in 2015, and I'm wondering what, if any, help would that be to the slum dwellers, uh, and is, is there something else you'd like the international community to do? Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. We'll take a third. The microphone has now arrived, sir. Yeah. Name and comment or observation very quick. Thank you very much. Th uh, my name is, uh, thank you very much for this great dis uh, discussion. My name is uh, Nicholas. I'm a PhD student at the Hutter School of Governance. And um, I'm not really a, a fatalist nor a, not a radical, but, uh, but sometimes I like to be one. <laughs> In this sense, um, I've got a series of questions. Hasn't the climate always changed? Hasn't, hasn't mankind always adapted to a changing climate? And isn't climate change itself so, not so much the problem, but the lack of the adaptive capacity of the, in the, in the poorer countries, you know, or more precisely, their marginalization and the global economy, which gives them little uh, political maneuver to, due to their lack of revenues, like uh, private ones and uh, public ones. So 
Do you think... All right, Nick, you said you had a list okay. of questions, which slightly yeah. worries me. No, this might, I've gone on. This might perhaps be... He, might. he made an asked question in, in Berlin and got specially interviewed afterwards. He's after the same question. <laughs> I think this might no. be the last of your list of questions. Okay. Thank you. So Thank you very much for that consideration. <laughs> so uh, do you think the rejection of free trade, for example, could be a way forward? So the, on, on the creation of, for example, preferential trade agreements, for example, instead of abolishment of... Uh, uh, okay. Great. Thanks. I, I'm not sure. I'm not going to run around the whole panel. Do people? I think some of that was directed, Mary. Could you start us off if you have something to say? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to address the question of political will, uh, yeah. because in many ways, I think I very much agree that the biggest gap at the moment in dealing with climate change is political will at the top, and uh, for that reason. We've created this climate justice dialogue and a high-level advisory committee to try to address at all levels of leadership uh, how to uh, uh, increase the political momentum and will to start making the transformational changes that are needed. This is not business as usual. And I think I'm, I'm now, I'm, I'm not saying I've got all the answers, but reflecting on how climate has been dealt with, you know, it began as a sort of environmental and scientific issue, understandably and importantly. And then with Nick Stern, the economics of it came into the picture. But until very recently, and Nick is very much part of this change, it wasn't an issue about people and about moral imperatives and about a real sense that this was actually happening now. Uh, in many ways, I think that uh, leaders in developing countries undersold their position by not speaking out more forcefully about the way it was affecting them. Small island states do, and very vulnerable countries try when they get an audience, when they get an opportunity. But many of the African countries, for example, that I work closely with now, with my special envoy for the Great Lakes, um, don't want to show their vulnerability. They want to talk about 5, 6, 7% growth, very understandably. But it, it means that we don't hear enough that climate change is actually producing climate shocks now. Uh, rainy seasons don't come on the, the, with the predictable way they used to. Um, uh, countries that had normal seasons now have long periods of drought and then flash flooding and then drought again. And it's having devastating impacts. So um, we need to close that gap on political leadership. That's one of the things that we're very focused on. And we have a short time span um, for 2015 to produce the decisions that we need. Okay, thanks, Mary. Uh, Nick, did you want to take uh, either of Sarah's or, or Nick's, or should we... See if anybody wants to take on those. I just, hey, yeah, I just want to take on the, the <laughs> radical business guy in the uh, halfway. Yeah, I like that description I, of him. I'm kind of trying to get my head around that one, but you know, I would like a few radical business folk to play on this turf. But you know, I know the UK could do with a temperature rise or two. That's true. I come from Australia, and the most moderate part of the world in Australia is the southern states, and I come from Melbourne. Don't live there at the moment, but I come from there. My kids actually had to endure weeks of 40-degree temperature in the mildest part in Australia this year. And my daughter's environment burns now, beautiful, pristine environment, the environmentalists around you, burns every year, and she's evacuated three or four times. So for me, that's a personal story. But you know my nightmare? I wake up thinking about my colleagues in Bangladesh. The world can't deal with, Mary, this is your old turf, but 10 million refugees. We are a selfish culture where we cannot deal with 10 million refugees around the world or the slums that Sheila talks about despite the three times growth in global wealth in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. And those 30 billion people in Bangladesh aren't the whole population, sorry, 30 million, they're not the whole population, they are the group that lives on land less than a metre above sea level, less than half a metre above sea level. And where do they go? Who's going to take them? So I know it's extreme, but those figures that say we'll go from 7 billion on the planet to whatever it might be, Nick, depending on the temperature rise we end up with, I'm sorry, but adaptation... You know, and a let's wait and see attitude, it's, I'm way too frightened to allow that to happen. Right. Okay. Uh, and then we go back. Okay. There you go.
Yes, do you want to come in? And then we go back for another round and you can answer again. Thank and then we... you to the radical businessman. Um, <laughs> why not? Um, I'm not the scientist on the panel or in the room, but I think uh, climate variation is different from climate change. You might want to pay attention to that. Um, secondly, I think that the question of um, <coughs> marginalization in the global economy, you are at a university, and I would like to direct you to some of the writings of um, scholars, such as Eric Williams, Capitalism and Slavery, Walter Rodney, How Europe on the Developed Africa, um, the British archives have a larger uh, holding on the role of what you now call marginalized economies and marginalized um, countries to the industrial uh, project. So this is something that ought to be revisited because if we are marginalizing the global economy, it is perhaps in part because of this historical legacy. And I think um, you will find that the post-colonial project in large measure has been an effort to move from the margin to the center, not your center necessarily all the time, but our center. Um, and lastly, I want to say that all that Nick Stern has predicted could happen, and the IPCC's uh, scientists, and some of what, um, all of what uh, Sharon has said, are already unfolding in islands and on the coasts of vulnerable countries, including Bangladesh. 90% of the, of the temperature rise in the last 50 years has gone into the ocean. And what do we face? Sea level rise, coral bleaching, dead fish, our livelihood and everything. Is, I mean, it is known that we are drowning islands, we are burning islands. So um, the sense of urgency that, that, that we bring today is real, and I think that um, what has to be done, you're correct, is this preferential approach to justice as a way of getting right. out of it. She, very, very quickly, because I want to, I, I might not be able to get a new round in before we go to Kyle, but let's see. Okay. Uh, at the moment, everybody's rallying around the single urban development goal. While many of us are also believing that by restricting it to one goal, you're again pretending as if urbanization doesn't impact more than half the globe already and very soon much more. And so instead of containing it in this way, especially a lot of grassroots movements want every goal to have significant urban dimensions. But again, because of the politics of how goals are developed. It's like better to have one than not to have any. And that's the way it is at the moment. Thanks, Sheila. I'm, we're going to have a, this gentleman who's got the microphone and this lady here, and then we're going to go, I think, I will go to you, and then we'll integrate the group in a further discussion. Uh, the gentleman first, who you are, sir, and question or comment. David Evans, philosopher. Uh, Political will has been mentioned as though that's the, uh, the solution. But it seems to me that the problem is a great deal more complicated than, than simply a matter of finding the political will. People at the top of politics are morally weak. <laughs> and, and, and the same applies to the whole of Western culture. If, if, if political leaders were to offer suitable policies to deal with climate change, they would be voted out of office. It's, it's a problem of Western culture in general. That, 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 is, that, is where, that is where you're going to find the solution. The solution. That's all I have to Thank say. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it got quite a... Yes, it, it did get a round of applause. Uh, very powerfully put, sir. Uh, madam. Hello. My name is Bernadette Fischler from Cafford, and I would like to pick up on something that Mary Robinson said in her address, but it's not necessarily a question just to her. Um, you mentioned that there are two important agreements ahead of us, the SDGs and the climate deal, in order to make sure that climate change is tackled appropriately. Now, in the SDGs, there seem to be emerging two schools of thoughts, one that think that climate change must be best mainstreamed across the goals, and the other one says that it would be 
best to have a standalone goal on climate change. There's actually a third one who might say that it's best to have both, to ensure both action on the ground and the high visibility on the public and political agenda. So I was wondering which school of thoughts the distinguished panel would um, adhere to. Right. What we'll do is we'll integrate that in comments a bit later, because Mary, I'm going to come to you after Kayo on the politics, and in particular these two provocative in the best sense, interventions. Kayo, uh, chair of the European Climate Foundation and vice chair of Deutsche Bank. We tell you back because it's a slightly separate role. Can you make comments on what you've heard from the perspective, I guess, of both business and possibly, as I said earlier, on politics? Well, uh, many of the answers will have to come ultimately from the private sector. Climate justice is not a concept uh, that is broadly understood in the business community. But in fact, it does resonate if you dig deeper and use a different language. And let me give four quick ideas on how to bridge that gap and eventually prompt strategic uh, rethinking and uh, a different investment in the (coughs) private sector. Uh, First point is on climate justice and long-term risk management for society. As a stern review has galvanized much business attention by using economic thinking and pointing to the important risk management aspects of uh, climate change, uh, of course also with discount rates and all that ethically based, I believe applying the economic thinking and concepts to the uh, difficult issue of climate justice would move us forward and this would resonate with the private sector. How should impacts of, uh, on the poor be weighed relatively to impacts on the rich? Uh, how much weight to give to rich future generations relative to poorer ones? And these questions. So my first point is on putting in the broader framework of uh, risk management for society. My second idea relates to um, climate justice and future growth potential Uh, in this globe. Uh, Obviously, the emerging economies and developing countries will grow much faster than the developed world. We have within those countries the global, the growing middle class, 3 billion new entrants to the middle class in the next 20 years. And of course, they are the bottom of the pyramid markets. Same time, of course, these are the countries and these are the potential entrants to middle class that are particularly vulnerable to climate change so that imperils market potential and global growth as well as people's lives. And there's some interesting study of time to go into how much of economic output might actually wiped off in these high-risk countries. So I think that is a second idea on how to relate this to future broad-based sustainable growth uh, where climate justice plays an important role. The third idea is that international equitable action on climate change is most cost effective again a notion that will resonate if it's uh, shared by all countries and if all countries share equitably to uh, the solution across all countries and societies. So this is the point of cost effectiveness of action and of course one can elaborate on that which would be very much understood by the private sector. Uh, The final point is on uh, redirecting climate justice and redirecting global investment flows and portfolio investments. Long-term institutional investors with many, uh, 20 and more trillions of assets are increasingly uh, from my experience concerned about climate change and are beginning to call on companies and governments to set targets, improve transparency and reduce environmental and social impacts. Notions of divestment what the Norwegians are, uh, their sovereign wealth fund is now examining stranded assets. These are new notions that are taken very seriously. And the good news is that from much analysis, one can show that introducing environmental, social, and governance sustainability, called ESG, uh, and these opportunities into business plans and investor decision-making can actually not only reduce risk, but also improve performance. 
That's why I'm a great advocate for integrated reporting, which means that reporting by corporates, by, gov by companies, should not be only financial, but should have ESG as an integral part, which then, of course, on stock exchanges and others could be picked up. So encouraging pension funds, insurance companies, these institutional investors with these tens of trillions here in that sense to uh, look at uh, ESG is, I think, a fourth idea that would resonate and you can relate to uh, climate justice. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thanks a lot for giving us that important perspective. Morally weak, Mary, you've known a few politicians in your time. <laughs> there has been a lot of abuse of you. None of it's accused you of being morally weak, I think. Uh, did you resonate there and listening also to what Janet was saying? I must say I do resonate to a considerable extent because there is a lack of that kind of leadership that is needed. We're talking about transformational leadership, not business as usual, not a little incremental take on what needs to happen, but actually facing the realities that we've been discussing. Uh, this is uh, a time of incredible urgency and there's a short time span for the context of the important decisions we have to take. Uh, it's one of those unique times where within the next two years we've got to get sustainable development goals, and I'll come back to the question from the uh, woman from CAFOD, and secondly, a robust, fair climate agreement, all in a very short span of time. And I have to say, the weakness at the top political level is also matched by somehow a lack of an urgent activism that we need um, in our world. We need social movements that are broad and deep and angry and urgent. It's beginning. Young people are beginning with divestment. They're beginning with, um, you know, even civil disobedience at times. But it's it's not really taking us out into the street. It's not really um, uh, something that people uh, that that is that is putting pressure on politicians. Um, you know, politicians do react to pressure. We all know that, and I can vouch for it. Um, and it's not there at the moment. So we have to also build constituencies of demand for fairness, demand for climate justice, demand for equity, demand for caring about the people most affected in a way that's very unjust and unfair. And that has to be like the campaigns against slavery, the campaigns against apartheid. We need to be in the same situation of a broad campaign for climate justice, for fairness, and for the decisions which politicians will take if they feel the pressure. And so, you know, it's a, um, uh, in Western societies, we really need a wake-up call. And I think the climate shocks that we're suffering are part of that wake-up call. But if I may, Conor, I'll just deal briefly with um, the uh, very relevant uh, question about how climate is to be dealt with in the discussion of the Open Working Group and now the discussion politically going forward on the Sustainable Development Goals. It was incredibly important, in my view, that there was a strong sense of the importance of integrating climate into the Sustainable Development Goals. You can't talk about sustainable goals uh, for development without taking account of climate change. Um, I personally would favor both a separate goal and integrating climate across other goals. Um, but I think the more important is the integrating, a little bit as uh, Sheila was responding on the possible goal on um, um, urban uh, poor. There, there's a limit to how many separate goals we can have, um, but certainly climate has to be integrated across and has to be linked with the important role of the climate agreement, which is to ensure that we stay below the two degrees and hopefully to the 1.5 degrees that would mean that small island states would have viable futures. Um, so uh, the two are very linked to one another and we will have to watch this space very carefully because it is by no means guaranteed um, it's going to need um, the uh, informed attention. You know, um, what is democracy? It is eternal vigilance. It is being aware of what leaders do and not letting them get away with um, the weakness that was talked about. That's our fault too. You know, if they're weak, it's because we have not put pressure enough to, get, to make the right decisions. You're the young people. It's you who have to... You know, go out of here, recharge in your batteries, and uh, feeling uh, engaged in this process. That is what is needed. Mark. LSE has to do something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> LSE. 
That's the answer to everything. Ellisy, when in doubt. Ellisy, thank you very much. Marvin. Marvin. Uh, Marvin, would a democratic China... You don't have to answer this question. Would it... Would it make things easier or harder in terms of achieving climate change uh, objectives? I mean, for China? Yeah. Or, yeah. If you were an activist in a democratic China, would that be easier or harder? We're hearing a lot of criticism of democratic cultures. What's it like to push for climate change in China? <laughs> a democratic <laughs> China? <laughs> It may be too sensitive for me. Maybe. I think you've answered the question. Uh, You can have a think about it. Nick, you've worked closely with Gordon Brown, Tony Blair. You've tried to persuade politicians for a lot of your career. Morally weak? (laughs) (laughs) It depends where you look. Um, I think I I prefer to look at it in the way in which uh, Mary framed it about changing the politics. How do you change the politics? I think uh, invoking uh, climate justice is one major part of doing that. Uh, Campaigns against injustice historically have resonated. Uh, What's difficult in this case is getting people to understand the scale and the depth of the injustice. Why? because of uncertainty and because of the effects of our actions coming with a time delay and because uh, what matters is the sum total of what we are doing. Essentially, we're running down children with trucks. But you see that effect only after some considerable time with some uncertainty and it's the collective amount of trucks. It doesn't look like your particular truck that's doing all the running down. That makes it very difficult. So that challenges our powers of exposition, our explanations that this is indeed a a deep, arguably the deepest of injustices. So it's it's for us to change that. Academics are in the business of uh, trying to put good arguments together and communicating them. Um, politicians in the business of communicating arguments whether they're good or not and it's much better much better if those arguments are good arguments and the better politicians work to make that happen Mm. so that's a big part of our challenge and we have to recognise that um, although these are effects in the long term delay is dangerous Um, Sharon underlined that it's because it's a ratchet effect, you're accumulating higher and higher concentrations and you can't get it out very easily, and delay is dangerous because the lock-in effect of uh, high carbon capital and infrastructure. So we have to get across the depths of the injustice, and at 0.8 degrees centigrade we're seeing a lot, and in the words of Ronnie Reagan, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's, uh, we're talking about possibilities, God forbid, of three, four, five degrees centigrade. So we have to, in our explanation, get people to see that oh, at the moment it's just straws in the wind. Mm. Nasty mm. straws, mm. but it's straws mm. in the wind. <laughs> and finally, as we do all that, and this is what I wanted to emphasize, maybe I'll keep it for the end, is that we need also the very positive story of what the alternative path looks mm. like. It's much easier to persuade people to take on injustice, as we must, to understand the risks and to be willing to confront them if the alternative story looks attractive. And my goodness, it does look attractive. We're talking about discovery. We're talking about innovation. We're talking about investment. We're talking about doing things differently. Communities which work together more strongly. Communities where, which have stronger uh, public transport. Cities that are much nicer to live in than current cities. So we have to articulate, develop that positive picture. We have to do it with imagination. We have to do it with economic history, looking back at past waves of technological change. And to pick up the points that Kaio raised, we have to do it with very strong examples. And those strong examples are coming through, whether you look at a Grameen Shakti and energy in Bangladesh, whether you look at the reductions of emissions that are coming in New York City, whether you look at the way at Unilever and Walmart 
smart are starting to look at their supply chains. Whether you look at system of route intensification in the Lander district in Bihar, which gets much, much bigger yields and much lower uh, emissions, we could we could go on. But the cheerful part of the story is in trying to articulate why it is that. Uh, uh, this alternative looks better. We can now see some of the examples coming in. Now, I won't bore you with the nerdiness of uh, economics, but as uh, John Brum and others have emphasised very strongly to us, this is the greatest market failure the world's ever seen. It is an enormous inefficiency. And even if you forgot about all these dynamic benefits, just fixing that inefficiency would give us uh, a lot more uh, in terms of um, bringing people together, avoiding a zero-sum game, and handling this problem. Great. I mean, I'm, I'm going to come to you guys. And as I, I've seen the lady there, as, as I do, Sharon, how are you going to persuade the trade union movement to embrace this future? Because you talked about it with great spirit. But actually, we historically, they will, at least some of the members will lose, you know, very strong union organizations within fossil fuels, etc. How Are you selling a kind of positive vision? Or how are you going to do it? Or do you think well, three, you won't put it off? three things. First of all, we've had now a long term, in the sense of a decade long, commitment to, to keep the temperature rise to two degrees or less. We also have, uh, in fact, done our research. If you take, we did this at the height of the financial crisis, bad timing, but if you take um, the 12 countries we studied in depth across six traditional sectors, 2% investment each year for five years can actually create 48 million new green jobs in just 12 countries. We've got an unemployment crisis, we've got a climate crisis, you can marry the two. I'm looking for partners to do the same uh, research if you shift 2% of GDP because, in fact, that's what Germany is doing. They're shifting GDP, but it has a similar multiplier impact in terms of industry policy and jobs. In terms of our miners, then, you know, most of our miners actually understand that it's not their jobs, tragically as that may be, that are threatened. It's actually whether or not we're going to fight for the transition for jobs, decent jobs, for their kids and grandkids. So, yes, there's fear. But actually, when you look at the figures, even if you closed, and we won't, again, probably tragedy, but even if you closed every coal mine in Poland in the next 12 months and, uh, you know, Polish miners are probably some of my most reluctant folk. They still uh, have companies who employ their own scientists who have a very different view of the world than Nick. But, uh, but you'd, you'd have to find jobs for 130,000 people. Now, you know, that's not going to happen, but that gives you a reality scale. So when people say, oh, there will all be all this loss of jobs, I say, sit down with me and show me where. Let's look at what opportunities we have for investment and what are the decent jobs to replace right. them because <clears throat> there are going to be millions and millions in energy. We can't make the demand yeah. yet, let alone yeah. other sectors. Fascinating. Kai, you wanted to come in, and we have two more from the audience. I'm sorry, sir, we will have run out of time. Well, I must admit <laughs> that I'm not a great believer that... Uh, <laughs> collective global action through the UN, as important as it is to work on it, will give us in the near term the results we badly need. And I am a great believer in having alliances of like-minded countries, cities, companies go for uh, objectives and, and projects, programs that meet the tests of a very clear uh, target, ambitious target of scale and of uh, commitment. I think these, these in the private sector, some of these alliances are in the making, what is happening in the consumer good industry, in decarbonizing the supply chain, on palm oil, I'm engaged in some methane alliance of the oil and gas companies to uh, to limit methane emissions. I hope the September 23 meeting in New York will have a very strong bottom-up as opposed to just top-down alliance approach here. I think we have to make this credible, show as we are trying to do in European Climate Foundation now for the chemical industry in Europe, that there doesn't have to be a trade-off to a large extent between competitiveness and decarbonization. If you have circularity of production increasingly, systems that produce not just the single product, the value chain across sectors from beginning to end, you can make the point 
that actually innovation and leadership from European chemical industry can come through decarbonization, the challenge of uh, higher energy prices, even if shale gas in the U.S. is a third of the cost. Governments finally to support that, if they did at minimum uh, what we call TLC, to give us the transparency, the longevity, and the certainty of the policy framework, and not retroactively change, not have a potpourri of too many energy policies, for example, in Europe, you would trigger enormous investment. And then I've talked about integrated reporting already, the ESG yeah. dimension. Then you move the needle. Yeah, fantastic. And Nick, you, uh, uh, sorry, Connie, you <coughs> asked quickly, a question, sorry. but yeah. Hungary, Monday, I had a conversation with a chemical unions leader from Hungary. They're desperate for this kind of yeah. transitional, uh, right. you know, impetus. So, right. Well, this is getting. We've got this lady, and we've got a gentleman. I'm sorry. There's loads of hands up, but we really do finish around. It's like it's going to have to be quick, pretty quick. But give us your Very name. Very quick. Please. My name is Julia. I'm a former student at this wonderful institution. I couldn't help noticing that in the title of your conference, it's written "Punishing the Innocent," but the subject is lacking. So, who's punishing the innocent? Who's the big punisher? That's oh, a great. Is that a great question with which to ask the panel to end? Uh, sir, you're the last member of the audience to speak, so we'll have your name if you can. My and name is Richard Payne. I am an environmental officer for the Lecturers' Union, the University and College Union. We have 150 environmental officers in my trade union. The question I'd like to ask is one about the impact on political will, which we say is very important, of corporate power. Corporate power seems to be expanding massively and political will seems to be diminishing in relation to that. Is this not perhaps because the fact that as corporate growth grows, the democratic spaces available for us to organise are choked off and, and limited? We see a massive growth of corporate power. If you, if you take an organisation like the, the, the Institute of Climate Accountability, you can see that since the Industrial Revolution, a mere 80 or 90 large uh, uh, corporations have, are, are accountable for two-thirds of the greenhouse gases in the world. Um, we, do, we do not share equally in terms of the environmental degradation that is going on, but the mass of the population suffer as a result of, you know, a few right. um, organisations. Okay, well, I'm going to... I'm going, to stop, I'm going to stop you because I want to get the panel in before we end. I don't want to go on too late. Is that okay? You feel you made your point? Brief. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me relieved I cut you off. <laughs> I'll be careful of my fellow union members. Get them on, <laughs> get them on our throat. Uh, we've got a little bit of time, not lots. I, I'm not sure I want to quiz round unless you really feel you want to just intervene with the last word. And I'll favour those who haven't said so much. So, Henry, you've been rather quiet. Do you want any kind of penultimate word? Well, maybe I can respond to the punishing the innocent. I, I think the suggestion is not that anyone's setting out to punish the innocent. The thing we have to worry about is we can, can and often do punish the innocent simply by neglect and not by paying attention. I, for example, almost all the plans for reducing the use of fossil fuel involve so-called pricing carbon, carbon taxes, carbon trading, and so on. It, that's a good way to get people to use less fossil fuel by making it more expensive. But what about all the people who now can just barely afford energy, and the only energy they can afford is the fossil fuel? If, if we just do nothing, <laughs> They will suffer, so it seems to me, though this is, of course, a long story, that besides pricing carbon, we have to also move very strongly and firmly to create alternative energy, disseminate it, make it affordable. This is so that we don't, without really meaning to, grind up other people while pursuing some other goal, which is also itself important. Great. Marvin, I put you on the spot on fairly earlier. Do you have any comment? And then, are you happy to say, I've been listening? I don't want to put you under any pressure this time. No, I would, I would say that's like people who say punishing the innocent, are, of course, those big emitter, big emitter, including China, I would say. Yeah, that's a quite simple thing. And I would say that people who's not taking... 
Sorry, I was saying that like big emitters are definitely the people who is punishing the innocent. And also people who is not taking actions is more guilty for some countries. I would say China at this point is doing a lot of things. We are right now investing in renewables significantly. So in this sense, you can imagine who else is not taking actions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marvin. Uh, I wonder whether we can go to Mary and then Nick. Uh, okay. yeah. Mary, yeah. and then Nick. Yeah. I, I'm glad you know, the question was asked about um, who is punishing the innocents, because I think that, that's an important uh, rounding of our discussion. Uh, and in a way, uh, some are punishing more than others, obviously, uh, either because they're supporting fossil fuel lobbyists you know, the, uh, at a time when we need to be removing subsidies from fossil fuel and moving towards renewables in order to avoid the impacts that we've seen. It's not a classic human rights situation where you can point to the direct violator and you have rights holders and duty bearers and you can have that. It's, um, the Human Rights Council has passed a number of resolutions saying that um, climate change has uh, very serious negative impacts on a whole range of human rights, particularly right to life itself sometimes, rights to food, safe water, health, education, shelter, etc. But it's hard to uh, make the argument of causation. But in my view, to a worrying degree, if we don't do something about this and do it very actively, we're somehow complicit. And we're certainly complicit insofar as future generations are concerned. That is a real concern that I have. But we are complicit because it's not fair the way the climate is impacting. And that's something that has come out very strongly on this panel, I think. Uh, There is a total injustice in the fact that the poorest countries and the poorest communities and the small island developing countries are taking the brunt of the suffering. And we're beginning now, the richer parts of the world, to feel some of these climate shocks. We're realizing, we're waking up a bit. But we need to wake up faster, and we need to be fairer, and we need to somehow realize this is not a trade negotiation. I've gone to these conferences of the party, and I despair sometimes of seeing delegates with their cards held tight. You know this, Desimony. You've been a a negotiator. Um, As if... You know, by negotiating toughly for their country, they're somehow serving something. They're not, because actually this is all about how we uh, are stewards of our ecosystem of the world, and how we uh, live up to the Brundtland Commission's report more than 25 years ago about what sustainable development is. It's using the resources of the world in a way that preserve the, 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 the development for the future. We leave for our children and grandchildren the world in um, the same condition that we found as far as their opportunities are. We're not doing that. Uh, We're in a very, very radically unfair, unjust situation. And we're complicit if we don't wake up and start to uh, engage at all levels. This is for everybody. And this is, to me, the most serious human rights challenge as Nick said, the complication is it's not immediate for everybody, it's not visible in the same sort of way, but in its implications, it is hugely, devastatingly worrying. And I think we need to make sure that uh, people join together in a massive human uh, uh, network of concern so that those with political responsibility and with um, private sector capacity to, to make change. And yet, I'd like to end on the same note that. Um, that Nick struck, um, we've put the focus on the innocence of the, uh, you know, in a sort of victim way, but actually the opportunities are enormous. Mm. Um, if we can commit to a zero carbon world by 2050, the job opportunities, the lifestyle, the potential, the innovation uh, is absolutely enormous. And I think that's a message we have to get across as well. And that's a message young people have to get across, that you want that future. You want it for yourselves, you want it for your children, you want it for your grandchildren, um, and it is the future the world can, can, can give us. I mean, it's a, um, the, the potential for the innovations uh, of renewable energy. Look at the mobile phone, what it has done. Um, I know that very much in, in Africa. It's used to transfer money, to uh, track markets, for health surveillance, for education. You know, it's just a, an example. Uh, what about the 1.3 billion who don't have access to electricity? We could change their lives. The 2.6 billion who still, still cook on open fires, we could change their lives. It's a lot of people in our world who could have a much, much better world as we 
transit to a very good lifestyle. Um, so, um, you know, go figure. Sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, yes, go on. Go on. Uh, Nick, penultimate word. I'll finish the thing off, but this is the last word on substance. How do we change ourselves? How do we? Uh, how do businesses change? How do politics change? I think it's a combination of pressure and alternatives, and having alternatives. The pressure comes, or should come, from understanding the dangers that we face, uh, understanding the injustices that we inflict. They should be pressures we feel on ourselves to change. Uh, companies put pressure on their supply chains. Uh, I've talked with a number of companies in the UK that buy a lot of electricity are talking about how they put pressure on their suppliers. Indeed, they say, well, we won't buy from you unless that electricity can be shown to be much uh, lower carbon. So that pressure comes in different ways, understanding the problem, understanding the risks, feeling the risks, feeling the responsibility, feeling the injustice, but also manifesting itself in the way we speak to uh, politicians, speak amongst ourselves, speak in communities, speak to firms, speak amongst firms. So pressure is very important. And we heard, for example, from small island states, they're, they're very smart from rather a small number of people in exerting pressure. Well, we can learn from that. Those are skills, and that's something that we have to understand. The second is, and it's resonated right through the discussion, it's where uh, Mary finished and it's where I finished. Pressure is one thing, and it's ne a necessary condition. It's vital. So, too, is having an alternative, and that that alternative is attractive. Many of us have underlined that. Uh, that seems to me to be fundamental. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, yeah. I mean, sometimes uh, we're, we're, we're finished, but I mean, I need to say that sometimes LSE is a great place to work, you know, and it's a fantastic platform for this kind of discussion. And I want to thank the Stuarts for doing such a good job. And also, uh, it was alluded to earlier, uh, it's a tricky thing to pull off this level of complexity with the amount of travel involved, the amount of synchronization of speeches and so on. So I think we need to acknowledge that Mary's operation here with Tara and Celine, I think, uh, with the Grantham, with uh, Marcus and Ginny and the IPA, Paul Sullivan, are here, the people who are not, as it were, rushing to the platform. But without him, this wouldn't have happened. It would have been chaotic. So, yes, all of them, all of them. <laughs> And, and a very bossy moderator. Uh, no, no, leave that aside. Leave aside. I, I, you only speak when I tell you to speak. <laughs> and uh, Mercator, this change in the European debate, this is all grown out of an investment by people in Germany who care about pushing ahead programs of research into policy and then into realisation. The IPA, my thing here, the Institute of Public Affairs, is trying to do that. Grantham has been doing it for a long time. So it's a way of translating scholarship into policy which then achieves change. A very hands-on kind of university perspective. But we do need to acknowledge uh, Sharon, no particular other, Kayob, Marvin, uh, Sheila, Henry and Desma, who have come here, uh, some of them travelling great distances, and have really given us a fantastic evening. So these various people I think we should thank. But yes, go on now. Separate, separate, separate. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, just, just before we, we go, I, I think we should reserve an especial gratitude to these two inspirational figures. I'm very lucky to work with both of them in different capacities. Mary Robinson and Nick Stern, where would we be, ladies and gentlemen, without them? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>